You are about to see this year's six finalists of the University of Bristol Three Minute Thesis Competition. This is an international competition by the University of Queensland that challenges doctoral students to present their research in just three minutes. Welcome to the Three Minute Thesis Final. When I started as a curator of sculpture at one of the world's top museums of art, I was so excited to walk amongst the greatest artists that have ever lived. But after a while, something became clear to me. I was a woman working in a curatorial team made up entirely of other amazing women, all passionate about the history of sculpture. And yet, in the galleries that I walked around daily like this one, all I could see were sculptures by men. I couldn't see a version of myself in the history that I curated. I thought, where are all the women sculptors? My research specifically looks at women sculptors from 1660 to 1837. It's these women who are particularly underrepresented in our museums. I'm surveying every UK museum, and I currently estimate that less than 3% of these have sculptures by women from this time. So why are these women invisible in our museums? Firstly, although I've identified over 120 European women sculptors from this time, many of their works are lost to us. Secondly, many women sculptors from this time were wax modelers, like Madame Tussaud. And wax sculpture has been disregarded by art history, and due to its fragility, it's rarely on display. So what can museums do to improve the situation? Yes, they have to start collecting and displaying sculptures by these women, but they have to do more than that. Because inserting women sculptors into our current museum displays amounts to giving them a small seat at a male-dominated table. What museums need to do is change the way they view sculpture. Abandoning the enduring image of Michelangelo, hammer and chisel in hand, hacking away at the marble, and understanding that sculpture comes in all shapes and sizes, and it's all valuable. Sculpture by historic women might be smaller and made in softer materials like wax, but that doesn't make it less important because part of its importance lies in the fact that it shows women today that their ancestors were creative and talented people too. The sculpture never has been solely the preserve of men. It's my dream that one day I can take my niece Blair to a museum and show her all the amazing women sculptors who existed in history so that she might understand women are more than just the subjects of sculpture, but they are the makers of sculpture too. Thank you. <laughs> All of us know someone who's been affected by cancer. This disease killed over 10 million people in 2020. But did you know that over a third of all cancer cases are actually preventable? Imagine all of the heartache and misery that could be avoided if we can identify exactly who would be next and intervene before it ever happens. Cancer is the result of genetic changes. Your body is made up of over 37 trillion building blocks called cells. Each cell has its own function. A cell in your lung might help you to take in oxygen, whereas a cell in your skin might protect you from environmental threats. Every cell in the human body has a genetic code. This is a set of instructions for the cell. Imagine being in a big crowd. You've got all these voices swirling around you, telling you what to do next. This is what it's like being a cell, and those voices are genes. We can increase or decrease the volume that each gene shouts at in order to alter the decisions a cell makes. This is important as it allows our bodies to react to changing environments. However, mistakes can be made with some genes shouting louder than they should. My work looks at whether these volume changes could cause cancer. Specifically, I want to know how does obesity alter the volume of certain genes? And which of those changes mean that someone is at an increased risk of getting bowel cancer? And what if we could develop a drug or other therapy that can reverse those changes, stopping the cancer from ever developing? 
In order to answer these questions, I look at the volume of genes across hundreds of thousands of people. I look at which volume changes are more common in people with obesity. And then I look at whether the likelihood of getting bowel cancer is influenced by those volume changes. Finally, for volume changes which are identified in these huge data sets of actual people, I replicate the changes in cancer cells grown in a Petri dish. I look at how these changes, which are caused by obesity, alter how the cancer cells survive and grow. This approach has led to clues about how obesity might cause bowel cancer. For example, metabolism, that's the way we get energy from the food we eat, seems to be important. The next step is to find drugs which can reverse those changes or kill affected cells. This would mean that the cancer never develops in the first place. As things stand, half of us in this room will be diagnosed with cancer in our lifetime. With research like mine, I believe we can change that. This is why it's so vital that we understand how genetic changes cause cancer. Thank you for listening. In 2009, after months of job searches and tens of interviews, Jessica, a qualified civil engineer living in Nigeria, decided to start an e-commerce business selling beautiful, sustainable bowls made from coconut shells. These bowls were a craft she had learned to make during the holidays as a way to pass the time. This business would go on to be worth over a million dollars, and all she had when she started was just a laptop and an internet connection. Five years later, she would be on the Forbes Africa 30 on the 30 list and be named by the Times as one of the most important women and influential women in Africa. But more importantly, Jessica had liberated her family economically. You see, e-commerce businesses continue to grow rapidly in Africa, in Nigeria, and around the world. Recently, Instagram announced that there were over 25 million businesses on the platform. Women like Jessica, who would have been left to the mercy of the political and economic woes of a country like Nigeria, have found financial freedom through e-commerce businesses. My PhD is concerned with determining and examining the critical factors that enable women internet entrepreneurs in Nigeria succeed. Women internet entrepreneurs like Jessica are important and vital to the Nigerian economy. I believe that my, my PhD holds the key to finding the answer. The work I do is required because we need to be able to create systems that can be replicated across the continent and globally so that we can have more stories like Jessica's. When my findings are complete, I want to be able to say, these are the steps we need to take, not wait on luck. These are the tools we need to provide and these are the policies we need to implement to create an enabling environment for more Jessicas to exist, for more Jessicas to thrive, to succeed and be economically independent. Looking to the future, I hope that my PhD would be adopted and adapted across the continent so that women like Jessica can be stationed at the helm of African innovation, unlike the women that lived before her because studies continue to show that when women are empowered, all of society benefits. Thank you. Can I start with a question? Are you happy or sad? If this looks familiar, you've probably seen it outside the toilets of a service station. When confronted with one of these boards, I sometimes find my hand hovering hesitantly over the faces. I mean, what am I being asked to grade exactly? The demand for me to categorise my experience according to four decreasingly happy faces sometimes leaves me feeling so annoyed that I find myself smacking the sad face and walking away furiously. I probably ever think these things. Or maybe I just have a complex emotional life. My research explores the emotional experiences of young people with severe learning disabilities who self-harm. Self-harm is associated with overwhelming emotions like anxiety, shame and depression that arise in response to adverse or traumatic experiences. However, if the person hurting themselves has a severe learning disability, the focus shifts from their emotional life 
onto their diagnosis and the environment around them. In fact, the more severe a learning disability, the less likely that the person's emotional life will be considered in relation to their self-harm. I've spent eight months with three participants with severe learning disabilities who self-harm using a observational methodology called ethnography. I remember a board just like this being placed on the table in front of one of my participants, Cassie. Cassie has lived a life full of lost and found relationships. She's known the death of people that she loves and she's lost things that matter to her. Sometimes she hurts herself. How do you think you did today, says the teacher. And as Cassie looks at the four faces, I think of her day so far because I've seen her frustrated and irritated being hurried out the door for her first lesson. I've seen her cheat at an activity and the joy of that quiet rebellion. I've seen a brief and beautiful intimacy between her and a staff member who responds to her with maternal affection. And I've seen jealousy rise in her in response to a peer. And now she looks at these four faces and she pauses and she taps the sad face. The teacher's a bit thrown. She says, Cassie, I think you've done really well today. And she taps the happy face. A staff member leans in. I think she's trying to tell you she's sad, she says. She turns to Cassie. Cassie, are you happy or sad? My research suggests that a learning disability, no matter how severe, does not reduce or blunt a person's emotional life. My participants have complex internal worlds and intricate emotional lives. A bit like me. Thank you. I invite you to travel with me to where I come from, far away, across the sea, in Western France. We are in winter, in January, it's quite cold. We are walking in a white wood, we can hear a few birds singing in the bear trees. And suddenly, this castle appears out of the waters. You have arrived in medieval Brittany, a land full of legends and fairy tales, where marvelous stories are everywhere in the landscape. They tell us about King Arthur and his knights, fair ladies and evil dragons. Um, now, many current works of fiction, um, like fantasy, for example, um, um, inspired by such works of fiction, uh, inspired by such stories written in the 12th century in France. Um, today, we remember some of these stories as they shape our image of the Middle Ages, filled with knights in shining armor and damsels in distress. But romances were not only telling stories about knights and damsels living in magical castles in Brittany. Uh, in the 1180s, a lesser known French author was experimenting his own aesthetics. Not much is known of him, but his works are so different from his predecessors that it could change forever our idea of literature. His name, Gauthier d'Arras. Not much is known of, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, if you had asked him if uh, dragons are essential to write a good story, he would have said no. If ladies should wait for their uh, lover to resolve their problems, uh, no, they are the ones that embrace adventures and rescue their lovers. This is what Galeron, one of his fem female characters, does, for example. Uh, in the middle of the night, she dresses up as a man, overcomes the castle's defenses, where her husband, Il, is locked up, and seeks him out. My research digs up this unheard medieval author by analyzing his works and comparing it with his contemporaries. Gauthier has so much to say about his time. Um, he tells the stories about self-made men that actually needed a bit of help, especially from women. He gives us clues about his contemporaries' um, conception of uh, virtue and politics, of love and faith like no one else does in his time. My, um, my thesis wants to rescue Gauthier and his unique vision from oblivion by giving him a space where we can listen because we can learn from him. Thank you.
judging is always very difficult. Um, uh, you're all brilliant. I've enjoyed this. I've enjoyed talking with my fellow judges. Thank you. And I've enjoyed chatting to everybody here today. But uh, I'll start with the runner-up, Emma. So congratulations. Uh, but we thought you did a, a really great job in communicating uh, some, I'm a historian, it's a really difficult concept in a way that worked, but which did not um, betray, did not abandon the technical side of, of what you're doing. So congratulations, our, our runner-up. Um, our winner, um, I'm, I'm afraid to say, I think I have to say stole the show from uh, the very first words. Um, Sophie. Congratulations. Um, it was um, passionate, uh, engaged. You drew us into that gallery that you showed us, um, and you showed us what was missing from it uh, as well. Um, tremendous uh, delivery, uh, wonderful telling use of, of detail. Um, the three percent point was 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 very effective, um, and uh, you've convinced me, at least amongst the six, that Madame Tussaud was a sculptor, and I'd never expected to to have to think like that before. And I think that's that's really uh, a very effective uh, presentation of, of the work. So, congratulations. And again, congratulations to you all. Uh, I know you, you might be thinking, yeah, right, well, he, he has to say that sort of thing. It's, it's the form. But I do genuinely mean it, all six of you. That was really fascinating, really interesting. Um, we've got feedback for you all, um, constructive uh, in all sorts of ways, even, even the winner, even the, the runner-up. We have... Uh, <laughs> things to tell you that we, we hope could be of, of value as you take things forward. So, but, uh, but thank you very much and well done. Okay.